Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is the Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we do industrialization. Industrialization, roughly from 1750 to 1900, is the most important change in human economic activity since civilization, since agriculture. It is agriculture, then industrialization. Even today, industrialization is what separates rich countries and rich people from poor people and poor countries. Industrialization is the replacement of muscle power with machine power. The results are a massive output. Take a look at any Costco, any Wegmans, any Target or Walmart, and then remember... There's 2,000 Walmarts with all the same stuff. Tens of millions of iPhones are made and sold every year. Massive output. Way more than, than people could have ever made individually. And what that does is make cheaper prices. Why does it make cheaper prices? Because I am making so many things, I don't have to make as much profit profit per item. So I want to make $1,000. If I make 10 items, I have to sell each item for $100. But if I make 1,000 items, I can sell each one for a dollar, which is way easier and I'll still make my same $1,000. So as long as I'm making a profit on the item, industrialization allows for cheaper prices. And that allows for better standards of living. You can own more stuff. More stuff is created. You can own more stuff. For the first time, you can have more, more clothes. You just have your work clothes, and your church clothes. Now you can have lounging around clothes. You can have a smoking jacket. You can have all kinds of crazy stuff. You could buy 50 Bic pens for a dollar. And then don't care if you ever lose them. So you could always have one on you and you don't care if you lose it. You get a better standard of living because for the first time you can own stuff. Own a lot of stuff. Own more stuff. And so your life got better. Second result is urbanization. Cities grow. Why? Because that's where the factories will be. Because the factories need to be in places that have, one, transportation, two, workers, three, uh, the resources and the ability to import, import resources from the countryside. Cities that already exist, London, Paris, uh, New York, they already have all those things. So if I'm a factory, if I want to build a factory, I'm going to build one in those cities. And so we get massive urbanization. Cities grow. As cities grow, trade increases. With trade increasing, you have more workers making more stuff, which means income increases, which means money for skilled labor. Skilled laborers are going to make more money, just like today. And we have a little graph of what happens to the real wages of London skilled workers. And for 500 years, they more or less stay the same. They go up a little bit. They come down a little bit. They go up a little bit. But they more or less stay the same. After 1900, it is a hockey stick. It just, it, it septuples. It goes up 700% from 18, really starts in 1850, starts going up. And you can see where the Great Depression is because it goes down. But it just goes, whew, like a rocket. That's industrialization. Yeah. 
What are the results? Massive technological advancements. As more money gets poured into things, we get advancements and then advancements on top of those advancements that are built on those advancements. We get steam engines. Steam engines give us massive factories, sh ships, transportation, railroads. We get electricity, which makes power more efficient. It also personalizes power. Suddenly, I could have electricity. I couldn't have a steam engine in my house, but I could have electricity in my house, which means now I can buy and someone's going to make personal electrical devices. We're going to get steel that allows for the density of cities. P build stone and wood only can go up, only can hold up the weight of a couple of floors. Steel, on the other hand, we've got 150 stories. We have a massive increase in the size of ships. We get the invention of personal technology, and it gets smaller. The sewing machine, the icebox, the phone, the camera, the typewriter, all increasingly got smaller as time went on and allowed for personal production. The sewing machine allowed you to make clothes on your own and actually allowed you to make multiple versions of that clothes. Like you could keep one for yourself and then you could sell. You could go into business for yourself. The typewriter allowed you to write, allowed anyone who owned a typewriter to write. The camera allowed anyone to be a photographer. You had to buy the camera, so you needed money. But once you got that camera, you were a photographer. The phone allowed for communication. You could talk to anybody and anyone could talk to you. Industrialization allowed for female empowerment because now so many more jobs are being created. There's money to be made. There's money for poor women in the factories, which are not nice places, but there are jobs for better educated women. There's independence in that money. You could go out to work. You could be on your own. You didn't have to have a man there all the time. You could create your own culture. The typewriter allowed you to write. The sewing machine allowed you to produce. So you get cultural creation by women. The most the most important, well, I don't know if it's the most important, but the most in fa famous and enduring is the novel. The novel is an artwork by and for women. It still is. The largest consumers of novels are women. For the 20th century, the, if you wanted to be a new writer, gentlemen, if you wanted to be a writer, you wrote romance. The idea of being Hemingway and being like, I'm going to tell the story of men being men. You could, if you were good, maybe find a publisher for that. But romance, there was an unending need for content. And women filled that space. There's also the idea that you can move to the city. You can move to London, move to Paris, move to New York and start over. Everybody knew you in the small town, but nobody knew you in New York. And so it allowed you for independence from your family. It allowed you for independence from your own history. You were a cow stealer in the small town. You're whatever you want to be in London. Your parents were drug addicts and drunks in crew. You were your own person in London. You could start over, be who you wanted to be, create your own self. And in London, in Paris, in New York, there was so big, you could find people just like you. There are problems with industrialization, and the most obvious is the slum and the ghetto. Urbanization without services. These places grew so fast that there wasn't the services to help people. Roads, electricity, um, sewage, water, clean water. That as London, as New York grew, you get the tenements, you get these places where poor people who are working 
and or looking for jobs in the factories are living in places that don't have the services meant to help people living in places. And that creates a new poverty. In the countryside, lots of people are poor. You had your small house, your small cottage. You didn't have much. But that was basically everybody. In London, there were some people who lived on the West End and had a tremendous amount. And then there was the terribly poor people living all the way in the East who had to smell all that stuff and who lived in poverty. Problem is unskilled labor got screwed. Wages crash. See, on the farm, you didn't get paid much. But what you got paid was essentially what people had always been getting paid because they hired a laborer. We needed a strong back. So women got left out of this. Sorry, ladies, you're out. You could feed chickens, you could milk cows, but selling your labor to work on a farm didn't work. So this is a male economy. So for men who are uneducated, who have no skills, they could still work on the farm. And they could make a steady, if not high, but a steady wage. Industrialization changed that. The machines do the labor. You don't actually make the thing. You push the button that makes the thing. Who could push the button? Anybody could push the button. And so since people are easily replaced, you crash the wages crash because people show up and they go, I need a job. And the factory owner says, great, I'll pay you two bucks to, to, to push that button. And the guy says, well, I used to make five bucks an hour on the farm, but that was hard work. This is easier work. So two, all right, I'll do it. I need the money anyway. Well, then somebody shows up and goes, look, I just moved to London. I need a job. And the owner goes, well, I'm full. I already got this guy who's doing the button pushing for two bucks. And the guy says, I'll do it for a buck fifty. Oh, really? All right. Uh, hey, Billy. Uh, this guy wants to do your job for a dollar fifty. What do you think? Uh, hi, I'm Billy, and that's not nice. Um... Yeah. Uh, so if he does the job, I won't make $2. Nope, you won't make $2. Oh, that's not nice. And I won't have any job. Oh, and I'll do it for a buck 35. Whoa, buck 35. I'll do it for a dollar. Oh, really? What do you think, Billy? Oh, a dollar an hour won't even pay my rent. Uh, I don't know about that. I can't really do that. Well, then you get nothing. Sucks to be you, Billy. Joe, do it for a dollar an hour. You are easily replaced. So wages crash. Unskilled labor actually lost money. In many cases. By moving to the city. And once in, you it was hard to get out. So they make up those wages by one, working more hours. So you used to work from sunup to sundown. Well, in England, in the winter, sunup is 9, 10 o'clock and sundown is 3, 30, 4 o'clock. That's a, that's a nice short date. It's wet and it's terrible weather, but it's a short day. The factory, once it gets electric lights... You put in a 16-hour day, 6 a.m. to whatever it is, 8, 10 p.m. So one is you worked way more hours so you can make up that lost money. The second thing is you, your wife and your kids worked. 
and their dollar an hour or whatever was added to the pool. So more poor people had to work longer in industrialization. You got also what we would call social problems. Pollution. On an unbelievable scale, these machines poured pollution out. Uh, London fog is, is the best example of this. London is famous for its fog. It doesn't exist anymore. And the reason why is London doesn't get fog. Fog is not natural in London. So why does London get fog? The, and what they used to call pea supers. Why? Because of pollution. Because of all the coal that was being burned in all the factories and all the homes for heat was being poured right into the air and people were breathing that in. Life expectancy in London was lower than the countryside. You actually lived shorter lives in London because of disease, because you're on top of people, because of poverty, because of pollution. Second, sewage. Because again, we have ghettos and more importantly, the sewage systems of these cities were not built for 500, a million, two million people. They simply weren't built for that. And certainly not to go from 500,000 to a million in 10 years. Like you couldn't build the sewage system fast enough for all the people who were moving in. And so urban diseases explode. Cholera explodes. Um, the Thames, the Seine rivers are disgusting because they're, just, they're where all the sewage went. It's like Venice today. You don't go swimming in the Grand Canal. That's the sewer. Venice doesn't have sewers. All of their stuff goes into the canal and they use the natural sea to kind of push it off, to take it away from the city. This, the tide comes in, comes out. That works when you're a few thousand people. That doesn't work when you're 5 million people, and Venice has never been 5 million people, it would overwhelm the system. But Venice does have a problem, and it's a huge problem of, they get something like, what, 60 million tourists, and those tourists buy stuff, so that creates garbage, and they poop. And the canals simply can't handle that much poop without disease. You get theft and violence. Why? Because I'm poor and you have stuff. Now, what? who poor people? Now, you go, oh, poor people are going to steal from rich people. That doesn't happen. It can, but it's very rare. Why? Because rich people realize very quickly, I don't want to live with poor people. I'm rich. New York is a perfect example of this. What they do is start moving uptown. Hey, we built a park. I'm rich. I'm going to live near the park. You poor people live down near the factories. And they start moving to 15th Street, from 15th Street to 35th Street, from 35th Street to 52nd Street. They, the rich people move up to get away from poor people. So poor people don't live in rich people's neighborhoods. They don't hang out with rich people, which means they can't steal from rich people very often. They don't have the opportunity because when you showed up in a rich person's neighborhood and you were a poor person, people noticed, especially the new police that are being created, whose job it is, is to keep protect rich people from poor people. So, th so who you theft from, who you committed violence against was other poor people. You got into a fight in the bar, maybe over racism. Maybe over money, maybe over a bet, maybe over ethnicity. Maybe it's something personal. The person you th theft from is your neighbor. Hey, he went to work, but he left his window open. He's got a couple cool things. 
I'll take them. And then I can sell them and that's free money for me. We get prostitution. Prostitution is the job all poor women can do without any skills and make enough money to live on and take care of children on. Now, in Western societies, prostitution has mostly been replaced by the service economy. So you get services, waitresses, bartenders, cleaners, uh, maids, uh, lots of whom are sexually harassed by their, their bosses. I mean, if you watch Downton Abbey, the, 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 the Lord of the Manor does have or try to have affairs with his maids. Like, that's bad. He's rich. They're not. He has control over their job. And you're like, well, she could just leave and do what? She's a maid to rich people. To keep her lifestyle, she'd have to go find another rich person. Great. She's going to show up. And she's gonna. And the first question they're gonna ask is, "Who did you work for before?" Uh, I lo- worked for Sir Billy. And what's the rich person gonna do? They're gonna say, "Oh, I know Billy. He's a cousin of my cousin." Cool. I'll give you the job. I'm gonna go right to him and see what he has to say. Well, a couple days pass, and then a letter returns. He goes, "Oh, turns out you are a terrible person." He doesn't like you. He was glad you do you left in the middle of the night. Well, I don't want that. So goodbye. And so that's power over future income on women. So like Harvey Weinstein, these guys have power not only the over the employee, but over their in future employment. And so sex work prostitution, legal, especially in France, uh, and regulated. I don't know what it is in Britain. It might be legal. It has to be for a, for a while legal, right? I'm, t- I'm thinking of the Jack the Ripper st- stuff, and I'm thinking brothels had to be legal. I know they're legal in France till the 20th century. I think they're legal in Britain too for a, for a long time. Because this was a place for women to earn money. Look at Les Mis. Fantine goes from working in a factory to a prostitute dying of tuberculosis in three songs. At the end of the day, then there's lovely ladies where the prostitutes are like, Hey girl, hey, we watch you coming by. Hey, we'll buy your stuff. Oh, look, you have no money. Why don't you become one of us? And she's like, no, I don't want to be a prostitute. No, I don't want to be a prostitute. No, I don't want to be a prostitute. By the end of that song, she's a prostitute. Then there's I Dreamed a Dream, which is how awful her life is as a prostitute. And then there's she dies. She goes from working class girl, Deborah Winger, an officer and a gentleman, to dead In three songs, four songs. And so we get poverty, crimes of poverty. Prostitution is a crime of prov- poverty. Few girls turn to it and say, that's what I want to be when I grow up. They'd much rather do something else. And these poverty crimes, theft, violence, prostitution... The idea that women were not wives and mothers scared the middle classes. It scared them. What is this dark underbelly that we're living around? Because the people who do the thieving, the people who do the violence are having children. And what are they teaching their children? The prostitutes will have children. And what are they teaching their children? Are they teaching them to be good Christian middle class white people like we are or something darker? And that's where progressivism will come in. The responses, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, communism, 
Capital, the book Capital, which is going to be a new explanation of history. It is a big ass book. It is a boring ass book, but it is an incredibly important book. Because it makes the argument that all of history is the rich enslaving the poor and hoarding the money. That all of civilization, all war, all politics is not ethnic based. It's not Romans versus Carthaginians. It's really class based. It's rich Romans versus rich Carthaginians using nationalism and honor within poor people to get poor people to do what rich people want, to get richer. Frederick Engels was a rich factory owner. Well, he was the son of a factory owner and he ran his helped run his father's factories. And he saw this. He saw this um, oppression of the poor people. And you get communism. And we'll talk about communism later. But communism is not... Communism is not the bugaboo. It's not Obamacare communism. It's not like the people who are so afraid of communism. Well, They're like, everyone will earn the same amount of money. Doctors and farmers will earn the same. And you're like, no. The idea of communism is you give to the system what you can give. And you get from the system what you need. So, my brother worked on Wall Street, works on Wall Street. And he had CEOs and bosses who wrote a check at the end of the year for $50 million to themselves. Hedge funds, $50 million. I know some of you are listening to this going, $50 million? That was a bad year. But they would write a check and be like, I'm going to pay myself $50 million. That's what I earned. Communism, capitalism says, great, do what you want with that money. In fact, reinvest it in your corporation. Communism says, you don't need $50 million. You could live a great life on $5 million. $10 million. Now remember, at $10 million, you don't have to work anymore. Very likely, you, you don't have to work. Your wife doesn't have to work. Probably your kids, they could have fluffy jobs, like entertainer. You know, they don't have to work on a hot grill on Sunday mornings, flipping pancakes, when you got $10 million in the bank. They could probably not work. But you certainly don't have to anymore, ever again, with with $10 million in the bank. So communism says, you get $10 million, and you live a perfectly nice life, and we're going to take that extra $40 million that, let's face it, you don't need, and we're going to use that to increase other people's wages. Because you take $40 million and you divide it up and suddenly people make more money. They make more dollars per hour. More dollars per hour it means they can buy more stuff which will make the corporation more money. This is in a way what... what Henry Ford did. Henry Ford looked at his workers and said, if I pay them better. Now, Henry Ford is not a communist. I I have to emphasize that. But his thinking is this American progressivism where there is some communism and socialism in there. And he looks at it and goes, if I pay my workers $5 a day, triple what they would make anywhere else. 
and I make less money. So I take my money, my personal money, and I help pay my workers more. I'm going to get stuff out of that. One, they're going to buy stuff. And I bet they're going to buy my stuff. Two, and they did. Two, they're going to be more loyal. They're going to be better paid. They're going to actually work more and harder for me. So I don't have the turnover. I don't have to keep teaching new people how to do stuff. I'll get more loyal employees. And three, I get peace because they won't keep demanding money from me. And this is how Steve Jobs works. This is how Google works. That we're going to pay you a lot of money. So stop asking about it. Money should be more or less off the table. Because we're going to pay you a good wage. And that's worked for a while. And it's starting to run into problems in like San Francisco and, and Seattle. Because housing prices have gone insane because of this. And so suddenly what was a very good wage is still a very good wage if you live anywhere but New York, San Francisco, and Seattle. Suddenly that very good wage is still a good wage but is now still eaten by housing prices. And so communism is not everyone earns the same. Everyone's exactly the same. It's we all are in this together and we shouldn't have inequality because rich people don't need all the money they need. They can help poor people. And it's good for rich people because poor people will then buy rich people stuff. This is how Walmart works. Now, I make the argument that Walmart should go and pull a Henry Ford and their own workers can't buy some of their own products. But the idea of Walmart is we're going to keep prices so low, everybody can buy here, and we're going to make a lot of money off a lot of stuff. We're going to make a little bit of money off a lot of stuff, which will make us a lot of money. But the Waltons have too much money. They own sports teams and in, in America and in Europe. They own massive amounts of land. They own, and you say, oh, well, they deserve it. They run a big company. And you go, yes. But do they need to make $100 million in a check when their workers, some of them are on welfare, are on food stamps? They could live a very nice life on $10, $20 million a year, a year. And then maybe their workers wouldn't have to be on food stamps. Or as many of their workers wouldn't have to be on food stamps. And that's the idea of communism. That you're all in it together. And it's Christian. This is how Jesus lived. Jesus doesn't have possessions. It's, it's like in a John Lennon song. Jesus and his 12 homeboys all walking around, sharing everything. The the loaves and the fishes is about sharing. Nobody owned those loaves. Jesus doesn't say, all right, I'll feed you, but only if you have uh, 1995 uh, per fish. I'll throw in the loaf for free. But 1995, you got it? Nope. Eh. That's not Jesus. Jesus is the loaves and the fishes. When he made turned the water into wine, he then didn't sell it at a high price because it was good wine. He let everybody drink it. So it, it is funny that in America we look at communism and it's this terrible, horrible thing. And then the most anti-communist people are call themselves Christians. And you go, but Jesus was a communist. Jesus believed in from whom one can give and to whom what one needs. In fact, the early church, you gave up your possessions in order to help the church, the group. So, so that's Marx and Engels. And they start preaching revolution. 
that the only way to change is revolution. The only way, the, I mean, I think um, the Communist Manifesto comes out, I think, in 1848, the year of the liberal revolutions. Um, because they say rich people will never give poor people stuff. They're never going to do it. They have to be made. And the only people who can make them are poor people. Poor people have to understand that they're poor and overthrow the rich. The 99% versus the 1%. There's also American progressivism and British liberalism, which are looking at communism and going, we don't want a revolution. They are also looking at the pollution, the social problems, the, 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 the problems of the poor and going, this can get bad. We can have a French revolution and nobody wants a French revolution. That's what the communists want. Nobody else wants that. No middle class person, even rich people don't want that. And so what American progressivism and British liberalism do is introduce social services, especially education for young people, training for young people that the government will regulate to help the poor. The government will build things and build institutions to help the poor. That before there was the undeserving poor and there was the deserving poor. Deserving poor were widows and orphans. No one can blame them for being poor. They should get help. And then there's the undeserving poor, young men who are just lazy, good for nothing and lazy. And why should we give them our hard earned tax money to them? Widows and orphans totally understand. Nobody wants an orphan to be, be in poverty. Totally understand that. But a 25 year old lazy bum, F him, give him nothing. And what increasingly is that American progressivism and liberalism are saying, no, all poor people need help. That the economy is not growing or the jobs aren't available. That even somebody who's work, who's, who's working hard and that's the vast majority of poor people, they are working. They're not making enough money to not be in poverty. And the biggest way of helping them is voting. You give them the right to vote. Why? Because the moment you give poor people the right to vote, political parties pop up to get elected from votes from those poor people. And the idea is you get less crime you get l and you get less revolution like in France. You, 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 you pop the balloon and let out some of the pressure so it doesn't, it doesn't you, 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 you open the balloon, I should say, that pop it because you don't want it to pop. And you get less crime and revolution. You go, why is there less crime? Because there's more government services. I don't have to steal from my neighbor if I can go and get welfare. I don't have to commit violence if I can get what I need to live on another way. And certainly... I don't need to hang out with other people complaining about the government's not helping us, which would lead to revolution. We also get romanticism, the poetry of Wordsworth and Coleridge and other people, which is the countryside is better. The small town, nature, traditions, feelings. You read Wordsworth, you read Coleridge, and it's all about kind of this nostalgia for the English countryside. Well, why? Because London is now a million people, two million people strong. It's paved over. New York is even worse because New York used to be countryside and hills and little rivers and a couple little lakes, and we paved over everything. New York and Disney World are the most man-made places on earth where man just leveled it, plopped the grid down, and created it. There is nothing, almost nothing on Manhattan Island of what used to be New York before it was industrialized. It just got leveled. So, there's a nostalgia for the countryside. The city equaled industry, whereas the countryside equaled labor and work honest labor in the fields, sweat of your brow. You know, 
arching your back in the in the sunlight in the setting sun while you take a drink of water. It's right out of right of Bob Dylan's uh, North Country Girl. You know, the countryside is better because the city was smoke and pollution and noise and crime and violence, and the small town didn't have any of that. Now that's nostalgia. Of course, the small town had noise and crime and violence. You woke up every day and smelled poop. I've gone to college. I've lived in places in farming communities. You wake up and either stuff is on fire because they're burning fields or things to get rid of it to keep prices or whatnot, or it smells like poop. It's one or the other. Noise. There's plenty of noise in the countryside. First, there's all the animals. Then there's the animals that are domesticated. There's crime. People steal from each other all the time in small towns. There's violence. Of course there's violence. I've been to a bar out west in ranching communities. A saloon, it was called. These guys fought all the time, every weekend. They got off the ranch, came to, came to the bar to listen to music, and punched somebody. They wanted to get into fights. That was what That was entertainment. And so it's a nostalgia for a countryside that doesn't exist, that maybe never existed. But it's the idea that the English countryside, the American forest, American countryside, was better than the man-made modern industry, that the past was better. It's a nostalgia. And that's what romanticism was in art. But in the city, you get realism. Newspapers, urban papers, the tabloids, Dickensian novels, Work, poverty, people get ground up. The newspapers, people talk to me and and they go, I don't listen to the news. I don't watch the news because it's always bad. Well, that is what the newspaper was built on. If it bleeds, it leads. Because we need to sell in a competitive marketplace. And we are the city, the urban paper, the story of the poor. The urban paper, the tabloid. And so it's people being ground up, and we see this in the Dickensian and Charles Dickens novels. How some people will succeed, but many people will be just ground up, ground under. And so we are going to talk about the 20th century. And the collapse of capitalism. And what will replace it? And you have to understand, people a hundred years into industrialization, into, into laissez-faire capitalism, are not happy with it. The societies are richer. A lot of individuals are richer. But a lot of people are poorer. A lot of people have less of everything. They have more stuff but they have less family connections because they're now alone in the city. They have less wealth because they own no land. They have less of things that keep them stable. And just as people can go in a nice, in a Charles Dickens novel, great expectations from nothing to something. They also go from nothing to less, to destruction, to a number, to a statistic. And people were already trying to figure out how could we keep the good stuff, the economy, the wealth, and solve those problems. Already in 1850, communism is saying we need a revolution. Well, it makes sense. We've had revolutions for the last 75 years. Revolution sounds like a great idea. Progressives and liberals are starting to say, we don't want a revolution, but we do want change. The romantics are saying, we don't even want what we've got. We don't want this. We want to go back to an idyllic age. We're, we, we, we want to return. We're not even conservative. We are a revanchist 
we want to go back to an, an age that, did, that, that I was a rich dude in the countryside who could walk the fields. And I knew my, my peasants. Ah. This patrician age. That's what they want. So they don't even want things to stay the same. They want to go backwards. And you get the realism of the newspapers reminding people just how hard it is out there and how much worse it could be. You know, you're not murdered yet. That's always the implied part of the newspaper. This happened to somebody else, but look where they lived. Look what neighborhood they're in. Look what job they had. There's not much separating you from them. Charles Dickens is writing not for poor people. He's writing for middle class people, for, for rich people. And he's saying, this is the lives that you're not, you've moved away from. This is how poor people live. Uh, the modern equivalent is, in, in some ways, um, the books like Hillbilly Allergy, which are like, these people voted for Trump. Liberals, read my book. And it, the book actually came out before Trump uh, was elected. But it's, I'm going to tell you about Appalachia. Now, Appalachia has been poor for 300 years. I've been through Appalachia. It's poor. There's some people who do very well. But the average per it's cut off from people. The hollas, the valleys, the mountaintop. West Virginia, Georgia, the Carolinas, that part of the Appalachians have been poor. Uh, Pensatucky have been poor for 300 years. They're just poor white people for the most part. And you travel through there and they live a different life than me in my suburban New York growing up. They lived a completely different world. We don't in inhabit, we inhabit the same universe, but we do not inhabit the same world. And that's not a, a speak against them. They think I'm the weird one because it's their area. And I can go, well, in the suburbs, and they're like, yeah, well, this ain't the suburbs, man. And they don't want to change because they don't want the suburbs. It'd be richer, but it'd be more grids. It'd be higher prices. Like, these are not people who want to pay $15,000 in local property tax like people in Haddonfield do, in Voorhees do. They don't have the money. They don't want to... They don't want to pay the taxes like that. And so here's Hillbilly Elegy saying, you rich liberals living in the coasts, here's what a lot of people in poor white people are living in. And that's what Dickens is doing. Now, he's not a newspaper, and that's what the newspapers are doing. But they're writing and saying, this is what poor people's lives are like. And that's how you get liberals and progressives wanting to change because they're like this is terrible and if it keeps getting worse we're going to have a revolution and nobody wants to lose their head so all right in our next episode we talk about imperialism when white people conquered the world when europeans conquered the world thank you <laughs>